I'm Dr. John Stone. I'm a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and the Edward A. Fox Chair in Medicine at the Massachusetts General Hospital, where I practice rheumatology. IgG4-related disease is an immune-mediated condition, a multi-organ disease that probably has an autoimmune basis. It can affect, as I've indicated, multiple organs, but it's got a predilection uh, for affecting about 10 or 12. So sort of starting from the top down in no particular order, um, the disease can affect the pituitary gland and the pachy meninges, the thyroid gland, the eyes, sinuses, major salivary glands, including the parotid glands and submandibular glands, and then the lungs, the aorta, both thoracic uh, and abdominal, and the pancreas, very important organ, along with uh, the bile ducts, intra and extra hepatic bile ducts, the kidneys, and the retroperitoneum. I've lost count, but I think that's about uh, 12. And as you can see, it is a very diffuse disease with the potential to cause lots of mischief in lots of uh, different organs. And that's not all of them, that's just the most, uh, the most common ones. There are several things that make this a very challenging disease to diagnose, especially if you don't think about it all day, every day, like I do. <laughs> um, I'm sort of used to seeing these, these kinds of patterns, but most people in practice don't see this every day. It's, it's less common than you would think, given that it wasn't uh, defined as being a unique disease until 2003. It's actually not that rare, but still, we don't see it every day um, in practice. It is also a slow-moving disease. So it's not a disease that smacks you in the face and lands you in the ICU, you know, one week after the disease began. It takes months, often years, for the disease to begin to play out and for there to be evidence of organ dysfunction that might lead to medical attention. So the very slow moving nature of the disease um, is another problem. And then the multi-organ aspect of it makes it challenging um, because no one, not even a rheumatologist, sees disease in all of those organs um, all the time. And uh, usually you, it, it, the disease presents with one organ problem to one physician, often um, a general practitioner, and it's difficult to put the pattern together when it you know, unfolds uh, so slowly. So yes, indeed, it is a challenging uh, diagnosis to make sometimes until the tape has played long enough and you can see that a number of things have happened and you can see a pattern of clinical symptoms, organ involvement, serological findings, particularly at elevated IgG4 concentration imaging studies, et cetera, but it's not easy. I wish it were as easy as just IgG4 concentrations. The IgG4 can be very helpful in uh, leading to the diagnosis, but we all have IgG4. It's a normal antibody. It's part of our immune systems. And uh, there are lots of things that can cause mild to moderate elevations of serum IgG4 concentration. So the IgG4 is neither necessary nor sufficient um, to make the diagnosis. In order to make the diagnosis, one has to exert all of one's clinical skills, skills as a clinician. So you've got to understand the, the signs and symptoms and the physical examination. Um, you have to correlate that with what you might find on blood tests. The IgG4 is quite helpful. But other uh, measurements can be as well. IgE, serum complement levels are sometimes uh, helpful. Laboratory tests that might indicate dysfunction within particular organs, such as a lipase level being very elevated or profoundly low. Renal function uh, being slow. Um, typical imaging findings, the disease tends to cause mass lesions in the organs that it affects. So the finding of a mass lesion in the lung, in the pancreas, in the kidney, um, should make one think possibly of IgG4-related disease. And then the final um, component is pathology. When there is a 
a biopsy that provides useful tissue, then that can sometimes be the clincher. Although pathology doesn't tell all the answers because the, the pathology is in and of itself not 100% specific for the diagnosis. So you've got to put all of those things together, the clinical features, the serological findings, radiology data, and um, biopsy information in order to make the diagnosis. Well, so rheumatologists are probably the ones who make the diagnosis most commonly. Um, we are, um, by nature, uh, clinicians who enjoy taking care of multi-organ system problems. Um, so these patients very often come our way when they are diagnostic dilemmas, evidence possibly of autoimmunity or inflammation. They make their way to our clinic. Um, sometimes, though, patients go to other subspecialty clinics because of their pattern of organ involvement. If the patient shows up with proptosis, uh, swelling and protuberance of one eye, that patient's going to be seen by an ophthalmologist uh, first in all likelihood. And the ophthalmologist, uh, increasingly ophthalmologists, are learning more about IgG4-related disease, and they're beginning to ask the right questions. Um, should a serum IgG4 concentration be checked? Should a biopsy of the eye um, area be done? Um, or the patient may go to a gastroenterologist because of abdominal pain caused by autoimmune pancreatitis, which is a, man a manifestation of IgG4-related disease in the pancreas, or jaundice. Patients can present with painless jaundice, which most often means adenocarcinoma of the pancreas. Um, but IgG4-related disease can mimic that perfectly. And a gastroenterologist or a surgeon uh, might be the one then who's got the first crack at it. Similarly, uh, sometimes the, there's kidney dysfunction and only kidney dysfunction. And so the nephrologist would be the one who might sort that out. Um, often with the help in all of these cases of the pathologist, if a biopsy is done, or a radiologist, if uh, there are imaging findings that really point in this direction. So it's most often the rheumatologist, but certainly not only the rheumatologist. So across the world, uh, steroids, which are used for everything, um, have been the cornerstone of treating IgG4-related disease, even in the United States, where we um, often have better uh, access to, to biologics. So steroids work very well for IgG4-related disease in controlling the disease, but they're not good at controlling the disease long-term. Almost all patients fail uh, steroids, or I should say steroids fail almost all patients. Eventually, when the doses get um, low enough, patients flare. Patients with IgG4-related disease are very uh, predisposed to, to bad outcomes on steroids. A variety of reasons for that. The disease tends to affect uh, middle-aged to elderly people who often already have comorbidities that can be exacerbated by steroid use, obesity, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes. And remember that uh, IgG4-related disease affects the pancreas. At least 50% of patients are affected by the pancreas, and the pancreas um, is damaged very easily in IgG4-related disease. So um, we know that patients who have pancreatic damage do poorly with glucose tolerance, and steroids exacerbate problems with glucose tolerance. Also, patients with pancreatic damage are predisposed to having bone fractures um, because of osteoporosis, and steroids exacerbate that as well. So steroids are not a great long-term choice for treating the disease. And that was a driving factor uh, behind developing new therapies. The non-biologic DMARDs don't really work that well for IgG4-related disease most of the time. They seem to be working as long as the steroids are on, but when the steroids are taken away, it becomes clear that the DMARDs really aren't working that well. So azathioprine, mycophenolic, mofetil, methotrexate, et cetera, have suboptimal efficacy. It has become clear that B cells, B lymphocytes, play a very key role in the pathophysiology of IgG4-related disease. We think they do a variety of things in this disease in addition to 
secreting uh, IgG4, which we think incidentally is not directly involved in the pathogenesis. But B cells make cytokines. They also, most importantly, probably present antigen or antigens to T cells. And the products of T cells drive the fibrosis, which is so, so much a part of IgG4 related disease. So we started targeting B cells uh, with B cell depletion really probably about 15 years ago. And B cell depletion works very, very well. Um, we demonstrated recently in a worldwide randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial of inebolizumab, monoclonal antibody targeting CD19, that B-cell depletion really is vastly superior um, to regimens involving only steroids for controlling the disease over the long term. So increasingly, steroids are being replaced. I hope they'll be replaced completely by new strategies principally those targeting B cells right now. And at ULAR, um, just a couple of weeks ago, I was privileged to present data from a phase two trial, which actually began before the pandemic. I think it was a real tribute to the investigators uh, getting the trial successfully through the pandemic. Um, the trial um, was a, a phase two trial of rilzabrutinib, which is a BTK inhibitor. It's an oral medication, which may offer a real potential advantage. It doesn't deplete B cells. Um, it uh, works by suppressing B cell function, and that function is readily reversible when the medication is stopped. So in short, we uh, studied in phase two about 25 patients with IgG4-related disease from a number of countries in the United States, Canada, and several countries in Europe. All patients received a very short course of steroids at the beginning, a one-month steroid um, taper that uh, started at a minimum of 20 and a maximum of 40 milligrams a day and was tapered to discontinuation um, by the end of uh, one month. And then we uh, treated patients simultaneously with rilzabrutinib, one pill twice a day, and then measured the primary um, endpoint or an important endpoint uh, at 52 weeks. And we were delighted uh, with the results. 70% of the patients, 70% uh, percent were in remission and off steroids at week 52, despite receiving only a very short course of steroids um, at the beginning. And in addition, there was substantial evidence of improvement in disease activity correlating with those good outcomes. One of the important outcomes was a reduction in the IgG4-related disease responder index of at least two points. That was a relatively low bar, we thought. But in fact, the improvement was much greater than that. The average improvement in the IgG4-related disease responder index, or RI, score was 11 points. So um, really dramatic um, improvement, dramatic and sustained improvement in 70% of the patients over time. So we were really pleased by that and delighted by the idea that this should go forward now in a phase three trial. So rilzabrutinib um, is an oral BTK inhibitor, Bruton's tyrosine kinase, a BTK inhibitor. Medications like rilzabrutinib have been used with great efficacy in the treatment of B-cell lymphomas. So there's a lot of reason for thinking that uh, these agents should be active in IgG4-related disease, and indeed that's what we saw um, in the, uh, the phase two trial. So um, BTK inhibitors don't deplete B-cells. Uh, they work by suppressing B-cell function in a, a readily reversible manner, such that when the drug is stopped, B cell function begins to recover pretty quickly. So the oral nature of this medication and the fact that it doesn't deplete B cells, I think are two potential important advantages of this therapy.